Welcome to another episode of Rough Talk VR, a weekly podcast with in-depth game reviews, exclusive developer interviews, and the latest MetaQuest and virtual reality news. We join our hosts, the father-son team of D. Scruffles and Stratus today, as they spend another episode breaking down and discussing the world of virtual reality. Hey, welcome to this episode of Rough Talk VR. Today we have one I'm so excited for. <laughs> Brata. Yeah, we've been <laughs> loving, on, man. loving underdogs from the art direction to the voice acting, and then of course the gameplay itself, the loop <laughs> of it all. We're, we're huge fans of underdogs. So today we're joined with Dave Levy. He's the co-founder of the studio behind it, One Hamza, but also specifically for Underdogs, he's the creative director and game director for it. So he's the man to talk to oh, for the it. perfect person for this. So before we go too crazy, Dave, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit more for the listeners? Tell them who you are and maybe exactly what Underdogs is. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, also, hi, and thanks for having me on the podcast. And also, thanks for mentioning Underdogs in the past. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, my name is Dave. Uh, all the titles and the credentials and all that stuff that you mentioned. Uh, I come from, uh, I've always been interested in gaming, but uh, we didn't really have any gaming companies around here uh, when I was growing up and becoming a uh, workforce uh, ready. Um, so I was in VFX for many years and uh, on the side, trying to work on getting uh, some gaming initiatives going initially through making all sorts of uh, game, fictional game trailers and then little by little finding the right people and working on our own projects in our own time to kind of you know, show the world that this is the thing that we can and want to do. And uh, we opened One Hamsa, our studio. Uh, we're five partners. We opened it, it will be eight years ago soon. And uh, we are a VR-only studio. We have two games out. The first one is Racket NX. Some of the VR veterans might remember it from uh, early VR days. Um, and then uh, a few months ago, we released our second game, Underdogs. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where we are. So what, in, what made you take the direction to, you know, it sounds like there's not a bunch of game studios near where you are. So not only are you taking a chance with that, but then also go into a you know, a much smaller niche of gaming. VR only. With, yeah. yeah, VR only. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of maybe counterintuitive, but there's actually a pretty big advantage in going into a new niche market when you are a new developer in an ecosystem where you're not alone. There's definitely some others around us, but uh, um, there isn't like a rich, long history kind of uh, ecosystem where we are. Um, and that advantage is basically you get to like, if you do your job and you stay on the bleeding edge, you get to grow with the industry and carve out your own niche rather than trying to find a niche in in the jungle, right? In Steam or one of the bigger, uh, one of the bigger platforms or uh, uh, consoles. So we figured like we started out actually with the two game projects. One of them was mobile and the other was VR. And very quickly, we realized that uh, for a studio our size without exp expertise and um, also with our inclinations in terms of what we're interested in, what we're good at, just being somewhere new and helping map a territory, we're more interested in that. It's more financially viable. Um, and we just found that it's just more interesting to us and more, more viable all around. That makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And for even even with what we do, yeah, because we know it's a you know there's other markets you can get into that have more of a true crime, yeah, yeah. true crime podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. saying no <laughs> more. You know the audience is huge, but to grow with the to watch it all growing while we're doing it mm -hmm. in real time is you can't go back and ever replicate that. So, it, but it's it is a risky move for a company to say let's gamble on this actually being something you know, that's going to keep getting bigger and bigger, Well, which VR, it is. But. VR is definitely in a much bigger state than it was when Racket NX came out. But yes. for any of the new, I guess, VR users that maybe missed that game, do you want to take us through the journey of that one and how that led to Underdogs, which is a vastly different game? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I just want to uh, go off uh, what you said a moment ago. It's I, I think it's not just a matter of being there as it happens and, you know, carving your niche as you're there. There's also the promise and opportunity to actually have a say in how things develop, right? If you come to a 
pre-made ecosystem, your your um, possibilities, your leverage for actually having an impact there um, as a take shape is much lower. And uh, being the individualists that were raised like in the 90s and 80s and all that, you know, growing to want to have an impact um, and believing that we are capable of having an impact that also kind of feeds into that. So, um, yeah, our first game is very different from Underdogs. Um, <laughs> it actually started out as a technical demo for a spatial audio plugin from a audio company called Waves, Waves Audio. Uh, they're a very big audio plugins company, and they made this spatial audio simulator plugin called NX. Um, and they wanted to make a demo for it in VR that will blow people's roof off, right? That people will listen to it and say, oh, I can tell where everything is placed at, et cetera. Um, and so a friend of ours who worked there and was actually in charge of, uh, of part of the product came to us. And we didn't really have a studio back then, but as I said earlier, we were working on our own projects this, like for a decade. Right, so we had our proof of viability. That's very important because even though the world wouldn't pay us for to do anything, we did it anyway. So that when the world was ready to pay us, we could prove that we got what it takes. Right, um, and he came to us with this uh, with this uh, project, and of course we said, "All right, let's make a game." And they were like, uh, "No, no, we just want a demo, thanks." So we were like, "Yeah, okay, cool, we'll make a game." So they got us the plugin, and we started playing around with VR. This is out of my apartment, like um, my my friends and future partners coming over, and we're just like, you know, all the computers one on top of the other, just trying to figure everything out. This is like a super early Vive dev kit. All the sensors are exposed. Uh, you have to reconnect it and do like the rain dance every three minutes if you want it to keep working. All this kind of really weird early day voodoo. Um, and we just we came up with this very simple concept initially, where um, it was, a br if you remember Arkanoid and all the brick uh, breaker games, uh, Arkanoid popcorn, all those things where your little paddle and you break the bricks above you. We're like, all right, let's do that. Like the, the, the upsides of VR seem to be very good tracking and 360 degrees. This is also what we want to showcase with the plugin. So let's try taking this concept, doing it in 360 degrees. Um, so you have a racket in your hand, that makes sense. You have a ball and you're breaking some dome around you. And uh, let's make it so that when the ball hits certain tiles on the dome, it disappears and appears, reappears from a random tile somewhere around you. And that way you can utilize the NX plugin, not just to say, oh, this is so cool, I can hear where it's coming from, but actually making it into a basic game mechanical element. Um, so that was the initial premise, and just um, I gotta say that I think this was also when I had my um, uh, I don't know what to call it. I hope I don't offend anyone if I say VR baptism or uh, like revelation, where I was uh, staying well, staying late it was my house. Everyone left one evening, and it was like <laughs> probably probably two or three a.m. And we have this really really simple thing. It's just a dome. We have. Uh, a, a, you know, a sky map of space around it. It's kind of this glass dome, just a simple racket and a ball. And I'm playing it and I'm a little high and I'm listening to trance music. And I live in Tel Aviv. There's like, I don't know, 500,000 people in pretty close vicinity around me. And just everything was gone. I was alone in the entire universe. No one living under me, no one living above me. No one living around me, just me alone in the universe for like an hour and a half. There was no game, but I was there for an hour and a half. And I think that um, uh, that's an experience that really stayed and stuck with me just to the power of VR. And I know that VR is social, supposedly, but to me, like the first revelation was actually, oh, I can finally get away from everyone with VR. Um, yeah, so... Sorry, a bit of a tangent. Getting back to the story. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so we came out with this pretty early demo. I think it was free on Steam. This is 2016, right? Um, and a lot of people liked it. A lot of people were playing it. And we kept pushing Waves Audio to give us a little bit more budget. Just give, let us make a little bit more of a game out of this. Let us do multiplayer. Let us do this. And each time it would be a very small incremental evolutionary uh, development to the game that had just enough new users coming and playing it and saying how much they loved it so we can go back to Waves and say, listen, this is, this is working, just let's, let's push it a little bit further. 
Um, and it went on this way for a while, I think until we finally came out with the early access one updates, um, which was a little bit more developed. Then we didn't have a budget for a while. Uh, we worked basically without salaries for like three or four months in order to get the second early access installment out. And then finally Quest was starting to be on the horizon meta. Then Facebook approached us. They were very interested in having Racket for Quest one. Uh, and we were, of course, eager to have any source of income and also eager very much to, to experience this new promised tetherless VR. And so we developed, uh, like Racket was one of the first games. I think it came out for Quest like a couple of months after the first Quest came out. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's still kind of a staple. I think um, we're like uh, 97 or 98% positive on Steam, probably 4.8 or 4.9 on, on, um, on the Quest store. And uh, it's really fun when we came out with underdogs. It just, um, a lot of people were just like, oh, uh, I don't usually like mech games, but I'm going to give this a try because I really love Racket and X. Or, man, these are the guys behind Racket and X. This must also be good. And just like seeing that um, the way that we um, approached Racket and X, the development of it, and our community in Racket and X. This was a co-development with the community, really, because everything was new. We were out as a free demo, then as early access. Um, this kind of reputation um, really stayed. Like uh, experiencing the fact that people remembered, that people cared, that people um, saw what we did when we made Racket was very moving for us, and we try to maintain that kind of attitude of just being honest, going above and beyond, and really uh, looking at our players at eye level uh, throughout Underdogs as well, and hopefully forever. So yeah, that's Racket. Was that answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfectly answered the question. So what, what year did the thought process start going towards Underdogs? Um, I, I think probably... Uh, 2018 or 2017, very soon after Racket and X came, came out for uh, Quest. And um, I guess for those who don't know, uh, Underdogs is a mech fighting game. It's a brawler. So as opposed to being in a giant building-sized mech where you shoot lasers and missiles and the kind of classic mech warrior or Japanese mecha-style mechs, this is like a smaller mech and it smashes. It's metal on metal. It's just full contact uh, um, melee combat. And the idea came, and, and this was kind of the, really the, the foundational idea for Underdogs, even before we had any of the world, any of the uh, wrapping of the game. Um, the very basic premise was, how can we make fighting be immersive in VR? Because to us, every time we tried a fighting game, our hand would go through whatever we tried punching, uh, we held the sword, but it didn't feel like it. And then this kind of dissonance of this is so much more immersive than Pancake, but but it's not quite there, actually ended up throwing us out of the experience more than it would have if we were on Pancake. Because there's such a higher expectation when two of your senses are so thoroughly immersed in the medium that when one of the senses, the tactile sense, isn't, when you you're in there, you see everything, you hear everything, you're completely enthralled. And then your hand just passes through an enemy that you cut with a sword. And that dissonance really bothered us. And we were like, there must be some, some way to do this better. And um, our premise, which uh, actually took us a very long time to prove to ourselves, was if we separate you just a tiny bit from the game world, right? If we have some mediating factor between you as, and, as the player and the game world, we might be able to keep the sense of proprioception and keep the sense of embodiment. This is me in the game world, but get rid of that dissonance of, I don't feel the weight. I don't feel the impact. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't see the camera shake, etc. cetera. And, um, and putting you in a mech was our solution for this. And that was the very foundation for underdogs. And this was 2018. So you came up conceptually then with, you knew you were going to go the max, but what about this lore that comes with the, <laughs> I mean, to me, it's, it's such Brada. a, it's such a crucial part of the, oh yeah, dude, we can't play it without, cause we'll, we'll play it, but we'll play in party chat and half of it's spent just being in character in the game. So it's like, I love that. to me, that's an int integral part of the, mm -hmm. 
the, the, the core of the game. So how did that all come together? Um, so there's two beats, I guess, to the prototyping. The first one is the one I just mentioned in 2018. And we were not very good at prototyping it. We went too detailed too quickly. Uh, we were gung-ho on trying to stylize the difference in the movement between you and the mech. And that resulted in us getting bogged down in details. And additionally, rather than trying to create a basic game loop where you are actually fighting something, we just got stuck at the very initial controls level, right? And this is just like, I'm spelling this out and, and explaining it because I think it's, a, it's kind of a very costly prototyping lesson that we had to learn. And if anyone else can learn from it, then I think that'll be a net positive. Basically, <laughs> just close the loop. Don't, don't deal with the details too soon. And so we were kind of bogged down for like a few months on this, trying to get it to work. And uh, after a while, we just felt like there's nothing here. Every time we try separating you from the mech, it just falls apart. It doesn't feel good. And then we went on a tangent for like almost two years, of prototyping everything under the sun, everything except for mech fights. Um, and finally, after nothing worked, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, lots of uh, like distress in between as well, um, uh, I came back to the team and I was like, listen, guys, I got to tell you, like this mech idea, it, it, it won't leave me alone. Like there's something there. We got to give it another shot. Um, I'm, I can't drag you like into this. If you don't agree with me, then, then fine. But just so you know, I, I feel like there's something that we got to still like find here. Um, and this was during lunch break. And one of my partners, Niv, said, you know, I, I have an idea. I think we've been going on this wrong. Let me try something. And he went back to the computer after lunch, and within 30 minutes, I shit you not, we had a very basic um, prototype that took basically a 3D avatar that we were working on, made it giant so that you feel like it's a few times larger than who you are. And it had the most simple physical interaction with a bunch of very simple physical enemies that we built for other prototypes. And it was immediately more fun than everything that we did in the six months that we tried prototyping it earlier. And, and that was the second beat. And from then on, it was just, I don't want to say smooth sailing. It was anything but. Um, but we never had another moment of doubt. And, um, and that's when, I guess that's when you can say that the lore started to, to evolve. Now, it wasn't in a vacuum. There was another side project that I was working on in between these two beats. Uh, you can actually go and check it out uh, whenever you want on SideQuest. It's called Ghosts in the Machine. It's this kind of short story in the 2.5D um, comic book style illustrations, which whoever played Underdogs is familiar with from Underdogs. So this was the prototype for that. And it was just kind of this blitz where I locked myself in my room for two weeks and came out with this. And there was a bunch of world building around there. I, back then, I was super interested in China and in can democracy survive the internet and is collectivism our only solution for the 21st century for surviving it? And how does AI fit in all of this? Um, and this is kind of the themes that I was exploring when I made the world for Ghosts in the Machine. And that later started developing into the world of underdogs. Now... This is like the philosophical background for it. The stylistic background was, I was thinking about the game and the style and we were really interested. We knew after Racket, we wanted to have a fighting game. We knew we wanted some violence and we wanted a game that wasn't like slick and cool and like uh, spacey like Racket was. We want a game that goes like, oh, you know, as, as loud as it can and just fucking release the monkey, right? That's what we wanted to do. And um, I was thinking about it, and I'm like, there's something about the British style of violence that is so psychopathic. I want to try harnessing that. You know, if you've ever seen, like, football hooligans, if you've ever seen, like, British bar fights, if you've ever seen British gangsters, there's something just so unhealthy and sick about <laughs> their type of violence. And I was like, I want to try going down that rabbit hole and seeing where it leads. So 
So, so I started doing that. I started like I've always liked uh, drum and bass and and bass music and jungle and a lot of stuff from England. And then I kind of started uh, listening more to uh, that type of music infused with grime, which ended up being the style that you hear the soundtrack of Underdogs. And uh, um, I started developing the game world, uh, which by taking all these things that I put together in Ghosts in the Machine starting to give it more style, um, some of it with the British type of stuff that we've been talking about. I was also very interested in trying to make a cyberpunk world that isn't based on how we imagined the future in the 80s, but rather how we imagine the future now. And right now, when I think about punks, I'm not intimidating. I, I feel like, oh, that's cute, right? Punks aren't scary. Punks aren't edgy. Um, we, we passed that. And now when I think about like gangsters and you know there's so many types of gangsters and like actual criminals in the world if you're looking at like uh, uh latin america if you're looking at japan if you're looking at uh, places in uh, inner cities in america there's so much like uh actual like people who don't really people who live on the edge of violence right I actually live in that type of neighborhood myself. And part of the reason I moved here, like I had a grenade blow up in front of my building. I have like uh, um, targeted killings happening in the main street nearby. Um, the other day I saw a bunch of people fighting with baseball bats under my uh, under my porch after one of them threw a Molotov cocktail into another one's house. Um, it's a hardcore fucking neighborhood. And I felt like, you know, cyberpunk could really benefit. I feel like it could be so much more um, real and captivating if I take the principles of cyberpunk, like high tech, low life, right? That's one of the core principles of classic cyberpunk. And I just try adjusting it for what we understand as, as, as criminal, as dangerous, and as, sci as science fiction today. And I guess these three things, like the ideas, the philosophical ideas about totalitarianism, about AI, about individualism and the human spirit and human nature. I mean, boy, have we had a lesson in the past four, five, six years about human nature. And I think also uh, these ideas about just trying to be um, up to the, like a modern type of cyberpunk and then like the British accent to all of that. I don't mean accent literally, I just mean stylistically. And finally, the last part, I guess, for the conceptualization of the world was actually AI image generation. I'm talking about 2019, way, way, way before Midjourney and uh, Dali and all these. I had to download Python scripts. I had to put in tons of parameters. I had to do all these things to get these really dreamy, unspecific images. And to me, they're just so much better and more inspiring than anything AI does today. And, uh, and they, those also really help define the style, the look, and the vibe of this world. Well, I, I love every second of the, the world you've created. Even the little details, like when you're in your Mac, you can smack your little... Oh, I love that. But you know what's so funny about the world of underdogs? And we've talked about this on the podcast before. It's not a style of music I usually enjoy. No. It's not an artwork style you usually enjoy, like right. the cell shaded kind of uh, comic booky style. It's not a movement style I usually enjoy gorilla with the gorilla no. taggy pull yourself. And I mean, usually I for a mech game, I would enjoy multiplayer more than single player. So as all these factors against it that normally alone, I wouldn't like, but it's put together in a way that makes it one oh, of my dude. favorite VR games I've ever played. I love the soundtrack. It's not music I usually enjoy, but you better believe five minutes into playing, I'm I'm jamming out. Yep. I love the movement style for this game. I love the graphical style for this game. So it's 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 funny. It's all it, these things that normally I wouldn't like, but put together in underdogs, I love each and every element of it. And it's we've never grown tired of playing it. That's the other thing. Because mm -hmm. it's like Winning is dependent upon you in a big physical way. I mean, you got to throw those punches. And I, I like that you said weight before because one of the things I know, I feel the weight of this mech when I'm throwing punches <laughs> and I'm hitting these things. Launching yourself back and then forward with the straight right oh, dude, all day. It's, it's the best feeling. 
especially the encouragement you get from the voice acting going on during mm-hmm. the game loop. So it's like as an overall package, it's just absolute home run. Yeah, I think after like five, ten minutes, we were like, we need a soundtrack of this. Yeah. We need to sell the soundtrack. Speaking of soundtrack, yes. is it a <laughs> sorry, sorry, out, I'll let you go. Uh, it'll be coming out really soon. Um we I don't know if you guys ever worked with musicians. Uh the term herding cats or hurting flies uh, comes to mind. It's very difficult, so it took us a bit <laughs> a while. But uh, we'll be coming out with the soundtrack. Some of it is actually public already. Some of it is tracks that aren't weren't uh, originally for the game that we licensed. Some of them are original tracks. Uh, all the proceeds are going to go a hundred percent to the artist. Like we're not we're not uh, siphoning off a dime, and it'll be available on Steam. I don't want to give a date yet because I'm not sure about it. But it's uh, going to be this summer. Okay, that's wicked good news. Not to be that hipster kid with it, but I would love a good record, a vinyl of it. Vinyl? That, that would be right. badass. So yeah, I was actually going to ask about you know how about if the soundtrack was original soundtrack, but it sounds like it's a mix. Some songs are original, yeah. some are licensed. Yeah, exactly. We started collecting, like handpicking the specific ones we really, really like, talking with the artists, and then trying to look for synergies between the artists, um, trying to talk with some of the MCs, the rappers. Um, and ultimately I think, uh, we just found a label and a bunch of artists that I know I've known from way back who make, um, basically bass and drum and bass music, um, and having them team up with the rappers to make some original tracks. Like one of the famous, uh, the tracks that people ask for the most is aggressor. Um, and that's the track that plays in the trailer. And that one is original. It's uh, one of my favorite artists working with a really, really good rapper and they just nailed it so there's a bunch of those and a bunch of uh licensed tracks i i think the i haven't heard a song on there that doesn't go with my what what's going on in the world so it's it's all perfectly fitting and again you better believe you're jamming out to it when you're in your mac Brata. <laughs> Brata, now, man. how about the the voice acting who uh who did the voice acting yeah shout out to jaffro uh Guy called Jaffro, English dude. Uh, we got hooked up to him through uh, Mikey from uh, who, who's a um, who has a uh, voice recording for game studio. He's incredible himself. Uh, it turns out later he was uh, a uh, is a vocalist in a really great metal band that I used to listen to all day long uh, called Sixth. And um, yeah, so uh, we just we did like probably half a dozen ses- recording sessions. Jaffro just knocked it out of the park. Mikey was amazing with just super high quality, super high attention to detail. Um, and also it was just so much fun putting together all these lines and just trying to build a character through them, trying to convey the gameplay through them, and also trying to kind of expand the game world through them without being too on the nose. You know, trying to just touch on a few things here and there that just make you feel like there's more happening behind it than what you're immediately aware of as a player. Um, yeah, it was definitely a really fun uh, part of the production. And I'm actually quite happy at... Uh, I was a bit concerned, like you're hearing the same guy in a very specific style, and he's just talking to you quite a bit. And I was very happy to see very few people say, um, man, how do I shut this guy up? <laughs> uh, like we've gotten lots of compliments for the voice acting and uh, it seems to hold quite well in terms of like if you play it even if you're playing it for like a d- dozens of hours people still keep him on you can mute him in the in the volume but people still keep him on so uh, very happy about that yeah some of the best I've seen in all of oh yeah usually you do even get annoyed the, the tone the humor the language in most it's, it's games the... when you have that talking Tutor- not tutorial, but, you know, helping voice, you usually shut them off, right? You usually get annoyed with them at some point, but not in underdogs. No, I find it all encouraging. And all the little slang written in, like we keep joking, brada and stuff like that, was that written into the script or did the voice actor kind of throw in his own little local slang? Uh, some and some. Some places, like most of it was in script. Some places I'd see that either it didn't roll off well or he didn't feel it, so he'd bring in something of his own. Um, I'd consult him on some things as well, like some were like, this isn't my native kind of style of speaking. 
So a lot of it would be like, is this like legit or am I like speaking out of my ass here, you know? Um, but also we developed a bunch of language ourselves for the game. So there's like, uh, I was sitting for months with my friend David and we were just inventing language. We have pages of expressions, words, all these things that kind of um, make the game sound like this street style, slightly futuristic, slightly foreign, but not quite vibe to it. Trying to incorporate things from different languages, uh, all these different expressions and words like brata, um, and, um, and at the same time, trying to stay, uh, at least when it comes to King, who is your brother, who is the voice who talks to you, a little bit more on the South London type of uh, tongue. Um, so yeah, a, a lot went into it. And um, I, yeah, it, it's, it's fun staying in character. I'm, I was pretty <laughs> stoked to hear you guys actually enjoy being in character yourself and using some of the words and some of the people in the reviews were like, oh, Bratas, this game rocks. Like, all right. So then, like, I'm glad that went in. So yeah. Well, my, my mouth is my language is very vulgar when i play the game too i you know full disclosure yeah i'd have to be careful streaming this one oh my an God. easy way to put it yeah oh but we you have all the filter on and uh, we <laughs> had our audio guy painstakingly go have, uh, like into every voice line and mark parts that are um foul and we have this filter that makes it sound like he's cutting off so it, it's not like a beep which would be annoying rather it sounds like if you turn on the adult filter every time he'll say uh, the F word, the B word, the C word, whatever. It'll just sound like there's radio interference. Um, and then the same goes for texts. You know, we 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 kind of do the hard thing like Steam does when there's like foul language in the texts. Because um, we've heard from lots of parents, they want their kids to play and they don't want them exposed to that language. And uh, we also know that a lot of streamers have a wide audience of, uh, of you know, young adults uh, following them and they can't stream with this type type of stuff on i mean it's fine if you destroy the living hell out of a thing that looks kind of like a dog but if you say fuck that will destroy <laughs> the kid's brain so <laughs> but that's okay we just go with it you know <laughs> i i yeah no i i would leave that shit on yeah i love the adult <laughs> language i love it's part of the atmosphere when i we were in party chat around the first time we both hit the same line where you know, the first time they throw the hard C around. I love the no fucks given attitude yep. of the voice acting, the the, I the laughed dialogue. At the, I laughed at the thought of like a kid saying, you know, can you buy me this game? And they just do it without doing any back research on anything <laughs> and just hearing the hearing the sound. But you well, can't act like kids don't. Well, I, every word I'm sure they've heard a dozen times over. You know, I even love that your social media, whoever runs the social media for you guys, they do it in character quite quite well you know uh so you you guys crush it all around but you mentioned that the studio formed with five people how about today how many people were working on underdogs so um the studio formed with five five people indeed and um we kind of expanded and contracted throughout the first few years i think at our most on underdogs we came up to like 15 people and right now on the payroll i think we're 12 or 13 um, and it was actually like one of the, there were lots of uh, challenges in this production. One of them was that um, the team actually came together while we were in production. So we were probably seven or eight people when we started production, maybe nine. And we had to augment the team as we were figuring out our pipelines, our workflows, what the hell this game is. Um, and so, uh, yeah. I guess that only about halfway through did we have our entire team up and running and uh, like um, uh, with proper workflows and all that. Seems like 10 to 20 is the magic number that we yep. hear the get a lot shit in done. VR. That's the, you can still get stuff done quickly. Mm -hmm. That's the size of, you know, most of our favorite games is that between 10 and 20. So not to backtrack too much, but going back to Racket NX, is there still an active player base in that game? Yeah, I would be stumped to tell you numbers, but uh, there's definitely an active uh, player base. We have monthly challenges every month and people competing for tenths of seconds over the leaderboards for these <laughs> monthly, uh, monthly challenges. 
And um, I still I still know people who use Racket as the uh, intro to VR uh, for friends of theirs because it's uh, so uh, low stress, high comfort um, that um, that people just are very happy to show it as the first thing. There's no locomotion. Um, you only need one controller. There's no like I think it's relatively safe to put someone in as a first VR experience. Um, yeah. Listen, it's 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 quite an old game now. I think like it's six years old, I would say, or something like that. Um, but uh, I I think um, I'm very proud to have it, uh, you know, uh, have a flag in the first generation of uh, VR games. Well, it definitely still has a strong reputation, so I'm not surprised to hear that it still has a. A thriving community but i i have some questions regarding underdogs that i would hate myself if i didn't ask having <laughs> you here in front of us so i'll jump right into it you know you you all have posted uh roadmaps in the past and in that has alluded to the possibility if possible of multiplayer how's that look realistically today in you know june 2024 Um, yes, I should probably have prepared myself for this question uh, <laughs> because this is going to have to be a tightrope walk between telling you stuff that's cool and keeping things a bit in moderation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so look, um, we have a roadmap and that roadmap is, uh, tentative. It basically says, these are the things we want to do in the game. And the very last installment, which we called in the uh, in the uh, roadmap uh, rampage in Nubraka, um, is leaving a place out for multiplayer. Now, multiplayer has been like by far the most requested feature, right? However, um, it's also by far the most complicated. It would probably require reinventing quite a bit of the game, um, even uh, if it's technically possible. Now, the technicality of it is quite a big deal. Because lag, even very slight lag in a game that's so quick and immediate, uh, would result in pretty high frustration. And so we kind of put it aside and said, listen, if the game goes really well, if we really kind of have a big following and we, we have the funding for it, we'd love to do this. Um, now for the tricky part. <laughs> so look, we're still on track. Um, for the, for the roadmap. We're actually mixing things around a little bit. We're working on the sandbox update right now. And it looks like what we'll be doing is kind of mixing it with the challenges update that we wanted to do a little bit later on that gives players uh, infinite run challenge, how much can you kill in 10 minutes challenge, that kind of stuff. I don't want to say too much about it because we're still kind of um, putting it together and I want to present it in the right way when we know exactly how we want to present it. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to work um, on getting multiplayer up, not necessarily as part of underdogs, but as an offshoot. And it looks a little bit promising. And I think that's all I can say right now, I'm afraid. Well, that's fair enough. And if it makes you feel better, this is just me personally. I went into this thinking this. I, I completely understand the amount of work that goes into making these type of updates massive system-wide updates like multiplayer and as well the roadmap that you all have of what looks like free content coming i mean i would have no problem paying 9.99 to to 14.99 for a multiplayer pass in this game personally maybe some of the community will will crucify well, maybe me even but... more if it's a complete offshoot of underdogs but you know it's just mm -hmm. as your underdogs multiplayer yeah. then I mean, of all the content to have be paid content, that one makes sense to me because you have the server overhead, you have com the amount of work it takes to to implement it. So maybe some of the community is going to crucify me, but I would have no problem playing for a multiplayer pass, so to say, or a DLC spinoff, whatever. Uh, but that's just me personally. But for your your vision of multiplayer in Underdogs, not saying that this is how it would go. This is just saying if if you could have a perfect world, you know, your fantasy for building it. I don't want anybody to hear this and say that this is what how it's going to be and happen. Just, you know, talking fun. Is your vision for multiplayer something that's cooperative or you do you think more PVP side with it? Uh, how about both? 
How about team versus team? Uh, I think that for me is the most fun in multiplayer games that I've ever had. I think that in terms of what VR is good for, I think co-op is just absolutely amazing. And I think that uh, PvP, on the other hand, brings the best out of people in terms of um, commitment. Um, and I feel like in order to do, like, we don't want to ask anyone for anything extra for any DLC that we do for underdogs. Everything we'll keep doing for underdogs is going to be on the house. We're glad to keep updating it. Uh, there's so much we wanted to do for this game and haven't had time to during the production. We're glad to do it now. We're eager to do it now. Uh, it feels to me like if we want to take what works in underdogs and not just tack multiplayer onto it, but rather do it properly, it's probably going to have to be a different game in the same world, perhaps, with similar um, uh, rules, perhaps. Um, and ideally, for me, uh, like, you know, we we went through many stages of thought from Double Dragon style, you know, two-person co-op campaign to just like full-on UFC style uh, PvP. Um, but it feels to me like the thing that would work best in VR uh, is actually something that is between collaborative and competitive, and uh, that's what I would be trying to create here. Still, like, I don't have a prototype working. I don't have any validation for this. And I don't speak for the studio, but for myself. But this is, uh, for me, what what would probably be most compelling for me to play. That makes sense. I'm on, I'm on board. And I can think of a bunch of ways it could work with unlocking new things for your loadout, by going into new battles, and you have to go to the shops, buy them. Yeah, I would assume upgrades mm -hmm. of some sort. Part of me still does love the idea of doing a run together. Mm -hmm. One person picks each option, and then, you know, we just go into the the thing and, and battle a bunch of enemies together. But I completely understand for like, you know, you look at what the most size wise, it would, it would be tough and current. So I, I kind of get yeah, it. Yeah. And I get the direct, I mean, PVP games are some of the most popular in VR right now. So mm -hmm. I, I completely get it. And if you can work as with a teammate, then you are getting a co-op experience. Mm -hmm. So it's a fair trade to me. I just, I love knowing that future things for underdogs are coming on the, the tab of the studio. Well, that's that's awesome to hear, too, that anything that comes out for Underdogs, the title of Underdogs, you guys don't have any vision for anything paid with DLCs or anything, just all free Unless content. Unless we have absolutely no choice, uh, but uh, we really... It, it feels to us like, um, as game developers, like there's the first thing that we care about is the game. And really, the game is the community the game doesn't exist without the players and to us like you know we had this uh, retreat after underdogs we just went uh, the founders and the co-partners we went out to the desert for three days and one of the things we wanted to figure out was you know last time we had a moment to think was like three years ago so and a lot has changed since then. so like who are we as a studio what are the values that we've been living up to what are the values that we had when we um when we were founded, uh, what are our private values as as individuals, and how do these things come together? I think uh, uh, the number one thing for us is um, is honest conduct um, and just being as transparent and candid and generous with our players, because we feel like this um, everything that we make. It's not even for the players. It's for us and the players. It's a collaborative thing in a very deep way. Um, so we really love communicating with our player base on Discord, on you know, on uh, social networks. You're mentioning like our our socials and how we um, keep up the, the the game's voice there. That's part of the game for us, right? This is part of the game. If I'm posting something on Twitter, like an update, and I say, "Yo, there's a new update, bitches." then this is the game talking with the players and we're all in this role play thing together. I love it. Right. And so as far as much as we can give, and I think we proved this in racket racket, we have like four or five years of free updates for racket. Um, and, um, this isn't because we've been making a ton of money, making VR games. Um, it's because we want to create this kind of, um, 
companionship, really. We want to feel like we're in this together. And the, the less we can have money in the, in the deal, the more I can say just, you know, pay me up front and let's forget about it and just have fun from now on, uh, the better for me. Because then I can focus on making the best game. You can focus on having the best experience. And we can focus on being friends and enjoying the thing together. Um, I, I think that's the way we look at it. And that's why um, we will do everything we can to not ask for more money for a game that someone already paid for. Well, I, I love that. It. it should be worth noted. The formula obviously works because, mm -hmm. I mean, we believe it's a good game. But as does the community, it's still it's holding at a 4.9 on the if Oculus page is one of the highest rated. So if it came out and never got a single <laughs> update, never got a single piece more of content, it's, it's complete, worth every penny. Yeah, yeah it's a complete it's a, game. Almost a masterpiece even, you know, it, it's so well done for VR. So to hear, you know, you, you see the roadmap, how much more stuff is coming and it's never, it's not. Makes me excited. Additional charge or anything. You all are crazy because Underdogs is very fairly priced as is so anybody listening that hasn't grabbed underdogs yet i mean it's it's an investment to buy what, it, what do you remember what the price in the store is today is it 30 dollars or 40 it's uh 30 dollars and i think it might yep. change i thought it was 30 that was right slightly. yeah I, I think there might be a slight regional change maybe it's uh, mm -hmm. a few books more or less depending on where you live but uh well I, i'm not my gut said 29.99 which is so yeah. fair for this game it's so so fun with the complete content that already exists with more coming that you're not going to get charged for. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. so something I've, I've got to ask because it's the first thing I, I thought when I played through and I finally beat Usman for the first time, which it's funny to think back at to how hard that was. Did you, before did you I notice did. what you just said? <laughs> you said, what's Usman? That? You said Usman, yeah. who's the UFC fighter. And yep. The name Kamaru the Usman. The Henry Kamara, Usman, the name of the guy in the game is Osam, which is actually inspired Usman. by Usman. So I'm just happy about the switch. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I've always just said, I've never even noticed that it's not Usman. I've always just said Usman. That's good to hear that, that that's where the inspiration came from because, you know, that's what my, my guess you gravitated to anyways. Yeah, I'm a big, big MMA fan. Uh, mm. I train yeah, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu pretty much every yeah, day. Yeah. So it's a big, big part of my life. So yeah, Kamaru is uh, one, one of my favorites. So that's awesome to hear. But when I finally beat him the first time, mm -hmm. part of me felt like that there should be like the, the, the game's almost giving me a way to save him. But I can't, you know, was that ever <laughs> part of the yes, plan and, so, and, you know, didn't make it? Yeah. So um, we'll get back to the MMA thing in a sec because I got something to say about that. But um, so when the game started out, you have to understand this was a blitz. Um, we developed the game in two years. Uh, which is very short amount of time for us with our experience and for a team that isn't fully formed. Um, and we really needed to figure things out as we went. Um, and the whole, like, we separate the game into two parts. One of them is the combat, and the other is what we call the tail, which is everything that happens outside of the combat, right? The stores and the events and the story and all that kind of stuff. And the tail started out way more complicated. There was a lot more text. There was a lot more interconnectedness between the events. And um, first of all, it became spaghetti quite quickly, but also we realized after a couple of iterations that it's I, I, like, as a player, I didn't really give a fuck about it that much. Like I cared about it a lot less. The amount of screen time and text that I needed to read was getting there, right? So. With Usam specifically, here's the story that we had initially. Usam was Aramesa's boyfriend, and he owed Apache a bunch of money. And depending on what you, these are two of the characters that you get to meet in, in the first act. And depending on who you played nicer with, uh, one of them would ask you, Apache would ask you to either eliminate him at the end of the fight or Aramesa would ask you to just take out of his arms and keep him alive. And depending on what you would choose to do at the end, if you'd spare him by just destroying his mech or actually splatting him like you do now, it would open up different options when you started the second act. Now, it sounds really cool, 
And maybe it would have been if we had like twice as long to work on this and have all these extraneous details and all these extra illustrations of different scenarios happening and the interconnectedness of all these things, etc. But it ended up just not working for the game as a whole. And so we scrapped it, but the whole scene was already in there and it worked so well for us. We loved that you had Usam on his knees, like this tiny speck and this pretty horrible and daunting illustration that our brilliant illustrator drew, where his <laughs> eye is kind of, you know, cicating at like super high BPM and he has blood dripping out and he suddenly becomes like this scared little uh, um, child, right? Um, yeah, not quite killing kids in the game, but still, you know, it was very, <laughs> it was a very intense moment. And, um, we decided that even if you don't have a choice there, we'd rather keep that in and have that moment of like, shit, I really don't want to do this and have King in the background saying, you got to do it, bro. I'm sorry. You got to do it. Um, and just keep that. E even the fact that you think you had a choice, but you didn't. There's something that's a little disappointing about it. And at the same time, I feel it makes the moment even worse because you feel like you have a choice, but you fucking don't. And you need to save your brother and you just need to kill this guy. And the first thing that happens after you kill him is that there's a text line that says, I've never killed a man on his knees before, but I had to save my little brother. And I felt like that eventually warranted the slight disappointment at not having a choice <laughs> by just making that moment more powerful. Uh, so hopefully uh, you enjoyed that part at least, but I totally understand that it feels a bit amiss because it really was built for something else. Uh, to me, it, I think you're right, though. It does create that this is real shit you're doing. Well, yeah, it's, dire it's, consequences. It's the wish I could, but I have to. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I didn't have to, but I have to. It, it, to me, it, it sets the stage for how how real the mech fighting is when it's person on person. So even though there's not the choice, I, I actually think that it does play a good part in, you know, mm -hmm. putting you into that environment. So yeah. great, great well, job with this one. Thank you. Uh, we had, you know, like most designers had, we had some pillars that we uh, established pretty early on that we wanted to be our core values that we go back to uh, whenever we have a decision to make about the game. So we had a few, like, I think it was four core pillars that uh, we wanted every aspect of the game to kind of adhere to. And uh, uh, I think the second one was, it's a dangerous jungle. And the idea there was, um, we, want, we want a game that goes hard. Um, and we want to be, we don't want, um, what do you call it? We don't want to muzzle. Um, because we're trying to think what kind of game we want to play. And... It feels like we're in a period where everything is nerfed and everything is smoothed out and everything is kind of cushioned. And um, there's merit to that. But also, there's something that we're kind of plastering over by making all of our content so um, docile. And we just wanted to go the other direction. And so part of the language is because of that and part of the um the whole game world and people die there a lot you know some of the vendors you go to some of the people the whole in the interactions between people are are pretty intense and pretty hardcore um and um and it felt like for me as, as as the game director my job was you know you were mentioning how like none of the bits of the game are things that you would like in and of themselves but together they make something that you actually enjoy playing and I feel um, I'm very, like, it makes me very happy to hear that because from my point of view, the whole, my job was to make sure that everything goes together in order to make a single coherent experience. And a part of that experience was it's going to be gut-wrenching and it's going to be violent. And uh, if you're familiar with the, the meme Return to Monkey, this was like the, the idea, like, I want you to lose control. I want you to feel like the inner animal is coming out. I don't want you to stand and punch like this. It's not going to work. You have to fucking swing, boy. Like, you have to get into it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. This is the real world. Just You have to fight, right? Um, so um, there was something about that that I kept trying to push, and that's also 
uh, to the point of Usam. And going back to the MMA thing for a moment, if I may, like, I, I guess there are two big things that I did when, like, personally, when we started working on the game in order, well, partially at least, in order to put myself in the right position to actually work on this game. One of them is moving here. <laughs> so like I mentioned earlier, it's uh, I love this neighborhood. I really do. But it is super hardcore. And um, the other is I started doing Muay Thai. So I, I, I've been an MMA fan for, for a very long time. But actually practicing it, I felt like if I didn't know some basics of um, of, of uh, hand to hand combat, uh, if I didn't know if I didn't know them in an embodied way, I'd probably um, not be doing justice to a game that is about that. And even though you know you can't really duck and weave, and there's no knees and elbows, and it's uh, it's not quite Muay Thai by any stretch of the imagination. Some very basic ideas like distance management, uh, like um, how you open yourself up to attack when you are attacking, um, how you want to find the moment uh, while your opponent is attacking, you want to find your openings there. You know, some very basic principles that, as far as I know, apply to most combat sports. Uh, those things, I probably wouldn't have known how to incorporate them and insist on finding them in the game's mechanics if I wouldn't have gone and done like a year and a half or two of Muay Thai. Um, I tore my labrum and I probably can never do it again since, but it was absolutely worth every moment doing it. Um, and yeah, so I heard you talking about uh, BJJ and some other of the podcasts that you guys were, were some of your other podcasts. I was like, all right, you guys are probably gonna, gonna understand where I'm coming from with like, MMA is like very, it's just all combat sports. There's something that I feel like everyone should experience not just for the self-defense or just that being in that specific zone of, um, I, I, I've done very little BJJ, but I assume at higher levels it's similar where you are just zeroed in in a very physical, very competitive, almost hunter-like state that if you lose your focus for a moment, you get fucked. And um, there's something so deeply engaging and true to this machine that I feel that I felt when I was doing Muay Thai that, um, yeah, I hope a tiny bit of that goes through in the game. But uh, I'm guessing that uh, as a BJJ practitioner, uh, you know a little bit about what I'm, what I'm talking about, probably experience it a little differently, but... So. No, ab absolutely. Everything you said is is correct. And even to what you said of, you know, it's something that everybody should experience. You know, if your body's physically capable of it, doesn't really matter the age or or being in shape, out of shape, anything like that. I, I highly recommend whether it's boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, jujitsu, you know, which is where I lean to. It's, you know, I'm, I'm feel a little cursed sometimes. I feel like I'm not my best human if I'm not training consistently and competing and stuff so it's like something i i feel like i i'm cursed i have to do now otherwise i'm I'm not the best person that i i can be i think it causes growth in a lot of different ways and that's cool to hear though the ways that you've immersed yourself into the creative well, vision that I, you wanted i've heard of method actors yep which you know they'll do that shit deep but i've never heard of a method game director but look who, at the end result well yeah because there's relatability to like 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 he said, if he hadn't done the Muay Thai, wouldn't have appreciated things in the game or even known to that those things should exist. Tell but, me you're not doing, you know, combat strategy while you're out there. You're in and out. You're I've being strategic. Never, never heard of a game studio person going that deep to get into the moving to a, a bad neighborhood, a rough neighborhood. Starting to train Come Muay Thai. On. Well, again, look at the end result. It's one of the best games this year for good good reason holy shit and i will say i don't see this as like a uh sacrifice like i i really love this neighborhood i really enjoyed and i feel like i grew a ton from doing muay thai um so it's not so much uh sacrifice as it is like going with it you know so uh, something i've got to know too because i i think <laughs> i picked this up maybe like my fifth run through Excuse me on players' names. There's so many different cool characters that you meet in the game. I'm sure each one of them is your baby. You, you know, you know their names too, right? Yeah. But uh, 
there's the first shop guy. He's kind of this little spazzy looking guy. I remember uh, Salonia, perhaps bald guy. No, I feel like he's he doesn't he's not bald. The first he's in the first act. He's one of the first shop people you can get. He can get murdered in the first act, though. Ah, nice. Like you can go to a shop and then he's not, you know, all of a sudden he's dead. The only times nice. I've ever had him him be dead is after taking a dialogue path where I go on a drive with the dudes that, you know, they have mm. you check his girlfriend. It's the yeah. second time you meet him. And then, you know, you take a drive somewhere with them and they're like, oh, it got bloody and they're dead. Anytime I've done that path is coincidentally when homeboy in the shop is dead. Is that who they're killing when I do that path or is that just a coincidence? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes of course. So, yeah, yeah that's actually uh, that that's uh, the repair guy called Busy. And, there we go. Uh, there we go. Yeah, that is the only like fully fledged event, like with a little bit of a story that stayed from the first iteration. Well, not the only, but it's the biggest and longest like kind of quest almost that we have in the game. And uh, there's so much backstory going on there that never comes through. Like GoBro, the guy that you actually do this mission for, we have all this text about who he is and where he is like in the caveman lands there and who they are and who his daughter is and wh what's happening with her and why he can't go and, you know, why he needs a ride from you to actually go there and fuck this guy who's actually fucked his daughter and fuck him up. And all that kind of stuff, um, but uh, yeah, you're you're an accessory to murder, basically. <laughs> you know what? I, I you could easily turn this into an adult animated series. I was going to say you guys should just with out, the I, amount of possibility of of story. I mean, it's or it's even a just raw an, world, you know. Even just an online a digital comic book series, just to just to drop as all the lore. As long as it was NC seventeen, like I would totally. I would not want that dumbed down for like kid friendly no because it's there's there's some real shit in this world but go deep i would subscribe to a, a digital comic book series that dropped every now and again that that gave some lore on these these bad characters hell yeah this game's built it even fits with the art direction i like the animations i yeah. would do animation i stopped doing that that quest we chain, just speak though. like it's just Pull it out of thin air. <laughs> I stopped doing that quest chain to go on that drive too because I like Busy too much. He's he's too good of a, a repair you need shop. The repairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my most val I'll never burn any of those relationships. Some of the other shop people I don't really care for. Mm -hmm. Who cares? I'll steal from them, whatever. But the repair shop people, those are my homies. I'm, I return I'm money now if I find it. <laughs> I used to keep yeah. it. I'm like, fuck that. I'm keeping it. I need my money. But now I try to be more of a better, better person and a, a very Mm -hmm. fucked up world and i know we're yeah. going over over a little on on time of how long we said we would rope you in so uh i apologize i got a couple more i gotta know see, a, i don't see as, the timer this as, episode, yeah just so coincidentally I, no I hit the timer you know oopsie yeah i saw you do that earlier. Right. <laughs> uh for yourself nowhere. what what's your recommend or for yourself actually not even recommended what's the loadout that you go go with in terms of weapons myself i always just do two big fist hands yeah, you know, big, like, big i don't do fist. the claw hand and one of my hands is just for going back and forth, and I just launch myself in and out with straight rights and overhands. But from the guy that made the freaking game, what do you go with? So there's a bunch of weapons that I really enjoy. Like, I really enjoy the grappling hook, which is kind of like this uh, grabber that shoots out and drags things to you. It opens up a bunch of cool possibilities. I really enjoy the blaster, where if you punch the ground emits this blast wave, this kind of shockwave thing that sends stuff flying with some upgrades and add-ons. This thing is crazy. But at the end of the day, just two knuckleballs, as upgraded as I can get them, just no nonsense, no fancy shit. I just want to smash things. Uh, that's, for me, the epitome of underdogs. I agree. That's pretty much my, my deal. Just mm -hmm. max out the amount of damage it'll do. But it should also be noted, it's the... Hit direction in the game is on point. I throw mm -hmm. uppercuts. I'll send something launching in the air. I throw a right hook. It's going to go flying into the... The physics in it is unbelievable, oh, too. They're spot What you just on. mentioned is actually because the trajectory in which uh, you hit an object isn't taken from the actual physical interaction of the mech's arm and the object, but rather from your player hand. So when you hit a bot, 
right? The mech arm might go like this. And so, for example, the mech arms, in order to make you feel more like a gorilla, the elbows are exp extended outwards more than your actual elbows, right? So when you're moving, you're moving like this. And you see the elbows coming into view, even if your elbows are, are tucked in. So when you're hitting a dog, a robot dog, for example, the mech arm might be coming from here, even though you came from a bit lower. And what we do is we take the trajectory of your actual arm, we calculate the impact according to the mech's arm, how much power you have, how, where you hit, etc., and we skew the vector that we make the enemy fly in to match what you intended to do. We do the same for the locomotion, by the way. The locomotion doesn't actually, like, the mech arms, when you locomote with the arms, they're just um, aesthetic. They actually don't determine any of the movement. The only thing that determines your locomotion is your actual arms. Um, and that, that way we can, this part of the whole, uh, we can, if you remember what, what I mentioned earlier, this like one degree of separation that the mech provides in order to keep you more immersed, we call this first and a half person because you kind of have this one degree of separation there. Um, and in order to make it work, we have all these little tricks where um, we go back and forth between what happens in the, the game world and what happens in the player world. And this is a good example of it. So you'll see the mech arm smashing into something, but the trajectory of the outcome is actually what you did with your actual arm. That's a lot of shit to go into making mm -hmm. sure a punch works. But I, yeah, because it feels authentic. Because I'll, I'll throw, I love to throw a lot of the, the looping up, under. Yeah, to send them flying, dude. Yeah, literally. And I'm an, and I'm an addict for when there's like the crusher that mm -hmm. comes down in the middle, or or the, the, the grinders on the wall. The grinder is my favorite. Mm -hmm. You put a grinder on that map, it's it's fucking over. Because I'm just gonna sit there and just with all my might, dude. That was what my original like go-to strategy was I would get the the grabbing hand and then I would grab them and physically put them in the grinders and stuff. But now I'm back to two, two knuckle balls. And the movement's great. Yeah. I, I can do a really good pivot with just the left hand. This game's funny too, because I, I kind of alluded to it with, with Usman. I'm, I'm probably going to always call him Usman still. That's cool. Uh, That's cool. <laughs> he, uh, I couldn't beat him, man, for the first forever. But then as soon as you beat him, now it's easy. And it's like that for every level. Like as far as you hit and it's a struggle, once you pass that point, it's easy to pass that point mm -hmm. from there on out. So it's not an easy game though. No, it's a game that you really have to learn and and to that trial and error it. But my my last big question that's good to get for people that are just may I, starting. May I say something to that first? If, uh, absolutely. If we have time. Um yeah. so you're mentioning the difficulty, and um I just want to say that like one of our meta goals with Underdogs, uh, we're core gamers, uh, everyone at the studio. We play PC games, we play console games, we're like old school indie and uh, indie gamers. And for us, one of the goals after Racket was we wanted more core gaming in VR. It's still something that I really want more of. There's only a handful of games that for me uh, scratch that gaming itch. Like, there's a lot of cool stuff to do in VR, but just having a game that scratches that kind of core gaming itch, there aren't that many. And we really tried doing that with, with Underdogs. And one of the results for that was that, on the one hand, uh, we had, you know, a lot of Quest users who are a lot more casual than the players we'll have on Steam, for example, and the game needs to work for them. And at the same time, we have all these super hardcore, crazy gamers on Steam who spend all day gaming. And um, some of them, th this had to be challenging for these kind of guys as well. And we still have outliers who finish the game on the first run or people on the other side who've been playing it for 20 hours or 30 hours or 40 hours and haven't finished it yet. Um, but getting it to kind of cater to everyone without the budget to actually have difficulty settings, which we still very much hope to be able to implement, was, oh my God, that was fucking difficult. So I'm happy <laughs> that you guys, it seems like you're kind of in a sweet spot where um, it was challenging, but you managed to progress. And once you progress, you kind of have it canned and you can do it again. It's very gratifying to hear that. So just wanted to mention that. Well, I think the the sweet spots there because it full disclosure, I'm not able to complete it every single time. I've had some some bum runs where I just Excellent. didn't do good. So 
also add to we have endless time for you dave so never feel like you have to to wrap up an answer fast or anything like that i wrap up more for respect of other people's time but if you have more you want to say i'll 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 never cut you off this is an honor to have you on to say the least uh but you guys did a a good job with the the difficulty my only thing is it's funny i i got a second quest three headset so i factory restarted my first one then set up everything on my new one and then when i went into my new one maybe i didn't set up cloud saving right or anything but it restarted my progress what i actually wasn't upset at because you were pretty happy about it i was pretty happy because i'm actually of the belief that the game gets harder as you do new games because like more characters and different you know things are unlocked whereas that first run i had the minimum amount of stuff Mm -hmm. unlocked so i I was getting awesome power upgrades for my my knuckleballs and everything like that so i wonder how if for a lot of the steam crowd that likes it harder I wonder if they were also the same players that were playing it in the beta and stuff like that. So they're already familiar with the game. Whereas when I went in for the first time on the quest, yeah, I died in the first couple levels because I never played underdog. And then the game's already progressing a little bit harder with more stuff added. Whereas it felt a little bit easier going in the second time with everything reset, but already knowing what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Just spitballing a bit too. So we have like a, a couple of small notches of difficulty that uh, automatically trigger in the game. So if on your first run you reach day five, if I remember correctly, I might be off on the numbers, um, then we kind of unlock slightly more difficult levels in Act 2. And the moment you reach Act 2, whenever you start Act 1 again, it's slightly more difficult as well. It's not a huge difference, but that's probably what you felt uh we also have all sorts of uh, little tricks like when you unlock a new object a new item for your next run there's a much higher probability of you coming across it for the first time until you actually buy it um because it might be quite frustrating to unlock something unlock something new and then actually not get a chance to to use it um so there's a, a bunch of these small tricks um they're pretty rudimentary uh, but they make um they're pro- they probably account for what you're mentioning here. Yeah, mm-hmm. that makes sense. That me, make- yeah. I like the the little built-in difficulty ticks you all have going. And for new players or people just getting underdogs, or maybe people that are struggling to get through Act One and stuff like that, do you have any tips for new players going into underdogs? Move out of the way when you're being attacked. Stay on the outside. Uh, staying out the outside is probably a very simple concept that will save people a lot of death. Um, so if you have a group of enemies, don't let them surround you. Stay on the outside of the group. Um, and then I think, look, I've been playing it for for a very long time. I'm not even sure what I do anymore. Um, but if someone is uh, liking the game and is eager to progress... I, I can just recommend coming to our Discord. There's tons of players there. They're super nice and eager to talk about the game and talk about tips and builds and game styles and all these kind of things. Um, very welcoming. And so, uh, yeah, just it's discord.gg slash uh, It's open to anyone. Super invited. I, th- I, I think a lot of people come there looking for advice and, and get like really good tips from the pro players. Good advice. Yeah. This in my head, I was even like, Discord's probably the best place to yeah. go for your, your advice in the game because you do get a passionate community. What about the name One Hamza? Where's that come from? Um, I, just, I'll answer it in a sec. I just want to say that also we're on the Discord a lot and uh, we engage with, uh, with the players a lot as well. So also if people have questions about the game that aren't necessarily something the community can answer, we're usually lurking around there. Um, as to One Hamza... It's actually pronounced Hamsa, and if we would have thought about it, probably we would have put two S's in there originally, but it's too late for that. Um, so a Hamsa, do I have one up here? No. Maybe you've seen this kind of Middle Eastern symbol of a hand with an eye in the middle. Um, and this, uh, it's also known in some Arab countries as uh, the hand of Fatma. And this is kind of the uh, good fortune slash evil eye word in the Middle East. It has a long history. doesn't really matter. The point is, it's kind of a thing that we like around here. And um, 
when we were conceptualizing the studio way before it actually opened, uh, we were sitting and um, we all had our day jobs. Uh, some of us were in other gaming companies. Some of us were working in uh, cybersecurity and shit like that. And we were frustrated uh, with how people do things, uh, with how people approach projects creatively, with how people manage their businesses, both business-wise, but more importantly, internally. Um, uh, what kind of values people work according to. Um, we were pretty frustrated. And um, we were like, we're going to do it our own way. We're going to make our own games the way we think it needs to be done and to hell with everyone else. And so we were sitting there and um, we, were, we were thinking, yeah, we want to make a studio that basically says, fuck you from the Middle East. And, um, and the idea was we'll make a Hamza that actually instead of going like this, goes like this, right? Um, so kind of, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and it evolved from there. Now, Hamsa means five in Arabic. We were three at the time. And it was just uh, coincidence and happenstance that we ended up being five partners, a nice little synchronicity point. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it started out, by just like being frustrated and rebellious and uh, and we kind of, once we got what we wanted, we kind of made it a little bit softer and just like, all right, fine, fine. We'll, we'll just do our thing. We don't need to fight with anyone. Um, yeah. I even love their little slogan on their website. It's like, I think it's making great games in the desert or making games in the sand or something like that. Just games, games from the desert. Games from the <laughs> desert. I love it. I love it. Uh, so before we let Dave go, this may be one of my new favorite interviews. I think we could keep him easy another hour. But is there anything else that you wanted to ask while we have the man, no. the creator of Underdogs? There's one it, of the creators at, on the spot. No, all notes are are covered. Learned a bunch of new stuff. Cannot wait to see the future. We didn't dive in a whole bunch to the roadmap because it's publicly posted as well. Too, I didn't want to you know, dive into a bunch of stuff people have heard, but I guess before we, we let you go, is there anything else you want to say regarding the roadmap, more stuff to come or anything that maybe people haven't heard or where they can um, stay up to date besides the discord? Um, discord is the best place to stay up to date. The roadmap is available inside the game in the main menu as well down at the bottom. And whenever there's a new update it pops up to the top. So if you have the game, it should be pretty much in your face. Um, I guess the only thing um, I'd like to say is uh, that we've been really blown away with uh, the reception for the game. Uh, people have been calling each other brata, um, <laughs> giving us really, really good reviews. Um, the community on Discord is absolutely banger, just like super cool people, like completely unhinged. And um, we really didn't know how this thing would be accepted because we went whole hog. And I just want to say that it's an absolute privilege and I'm super thankful that we got to do the game that we wanted to make without pulling any punches and that it's been so well received. It's, um, uh, it's not just validation, it also carries a sense of... Um, uh, not being alone, you know, um, being understood by other fellow human beings. Isn't this cool? Yeah, it's cool. Cool. We understand each other. And uh, that's uh, that's a really good feeling and um, a really good motivator. So thank you, everyone who uh, contacted us or left reviews or talk about this on podcasts. Um, it really warms our hearts and makes us connected to humanity in a way that we really can't do otherwise. So, I guess, thank you. Love the positivity. I hope we see more games coming from the desert because I have full faith in the studio with what they're bringing yeah. to the table. And I guess not to know numbers or anything like that. You know, it's not my <laughs> business at all to, to know anything exact, but I guess was underdogs. Is there a future of one Hamza? Did it, did it, meet expectations in that regard that there's going to be you know there's more content and stuff coming the things look um, good let's put it this way the reception has been overwhelming in terms of um how people have responded to it 
Um, in terms of actual sales, uh, we're hustling. There's no break. We've had to hustle since the moment the game came out. Um, and uh, that's VR development where it is right now. It's a hustle. There's, uh, we're, it'll be a while before the game even returns on investment. And we are trying not just to keep it alive and develop it. We're trying to expand and make more. Um, so yeah, it's an uphill battle, but uh, we feel like we're built for it, and uh, hopefully we can get there. Well, to any of the listeners, man, for thirty yeah. bucks, there's very few games I, I give so much recommendation that it's, uh, dude, you I'm, can get in character, man. Yeah, and Come just on. play it. It's like I'm not even usually big on rogue lights. Here I am saying like VR has enough rogue lights. Like we don't need any more. I'm not going to enjoy the next one. And then Underdogs comes out, and I go, well, this might be my freaking one of my favorite games this yeah. year. So, I mean, dude, if you're a listener, you haven't grabbed it yet, go support a great development studio. They have have great plans coming with, you know, the vision of, of even free content for Underdogs. So, I mean, go support them. Go grab this one. Drop them a five-star review on the store. Help them maintain that 4.9 <laughs> overall. That's a, that's a great rating. Yeah, well-deserved. Again, it one of those games just play it you're going to love it don't don't listen to how it's described don't watch footage play it yourself <laughs> you're going to freaking love it oh you get ready to laugh yeah it's 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 a good one so thank you so much dave for for joining us today again to thank the listeners go check out yeah this is one of my new new favorite interviews for sure i was so excited for this one just because of how much we love underdog so to the listeners go check it out drop them a five-star story review go hop in their discord same to us. Go check out our Discord. Drop us a five-star review. All that stuff. See you all in the jungle. See you all in the jungle. Welcome to the jungle, mofuckers. All right, and we'll see you all next week. All right, ciao, ciao.